Well, let's see. Is this thing working? I think so. I'm back again, YouTube enthusiasts, with another repair video. You know, I said in one of my previous videos, uh, uh, working on my wife's Kia, I cursed myself. I told myself I haven't done a video in a while, and I haven't had any uh, auto repairs, and that was a mistake. Here in the last week, I'm working on my third auto repair. The first one was my wife's Kia, the tensioner and I, uh, pulley and idler pulley. I had to change out, went ahead and changed that belt. The next day, I started working on the front disc brakes where the pads had uh, worn down significantly. And since we're headed to the mountains to take my daughter to college here in the very near future, I uh, decided to go ahead and repair that. Um, then, my 1999 Ford Ranger XLT got the big uh, V6 4 liter in it and has about 116,000 miles on it, I believe. Yeah, somewhere in that vicinity. Had an issue that I noticed uh, started a couple of months ago, but I don't drive this truck that often. So I didn't pay much attention to it until I could kind of catch up and the weather would warm up because it started doing this when it was cold. Uh, I had a small issue in, in symptomology. I would leave it parked. I would then, um, you know, put it in reverse. I would let the parking brake go. And when you would start to back up, it would grab a little bit and you hear a pop. Now I knew it was coming from the rear. Um, I could reverse that. I could say, you know, put it in drive let the parking gear go and it would do the same thing grab and a noticeable pop yesterday I was uh, taking things to be recycled and it began doing it even with the parking brake not engaged so I said well let's go ahead and, and get to that because I've got to take uh, my trailer and take some more things to the dump and I want to make sure that you know everything is okay at first I thought maybe the rear brake pads were catching Maybe they were worn down, and but I didn't hear any metal-to-metal -metal contact. And I thought that well, possibly the parking brake cable is not engaging and disengaging properly. I still think that is an issue, but I uh, pulled this uh, driver's side rear tire off and found something I, I really wasn't expecting. So let me move this uh, tripod over, and I'll try and shine some light as to where you can see what I did find. Now, of course, uh, I'm, I'm working today on the driver's side, and that's the shady side. So I'm going to have to put a little light to it so you can see it. So give me a second to set this up again. All right, again, and as, as perspective goes, this is the driver's side rear drum brake. Let me focus or actually zoom in a little bit here. Now, what I'm going to try and show you, I hope this does come out well on the camera. Again, please remember, it's a one-man show. I've got a little LED light here. What I found was grease everywhere. The pads actually look pretty good and have a lot of life to them. So they weren't as worn as I thought. But what I did find was lots of grease. I mean dust. That's normal. But there was a lot of grease in here. Now I've spritzed a lot of this off with my brake clean. At first I thought it was the actual cylinder, but no, it's it's grease. Pardon me. But a lot of that grease was right in here. Now, it's lot, I've had this open all night, so it actually dried up a little bit, but a lot of that grease was here. But it's everywhere, all the way around. Very noticeable. Again, it's, it's dried. And people tell me, when you have an axle seal leak, it has its own particular odor. And I could smell that yesterday when it was still moist. It, it is rather pungent. But in my line of work, odor is odor. I mean, I take care, take care of people with wounds day in and day out. So I can walk by a room and I know exactly what kind of wound they have. Lots of stuff in here. So I do need to clean this up, but I've got to pull this axle. I have not pulled the axle on the passenger side yet, but if I'm doing one, I'm going to go ahead and do the other. I 
again, quite a bit of life left in these pads. I may yet have to pull those off and clean behind it. And I still think I've got an issue down here with this parking brake cable. But we'll, we'll see how that goes. So I'm going to do a little video on how to pull the axle on this vehicle. What I don't know at this point, there are apparently um, two axles. One's like a 7 inch, one's like an 8 inch, 8.8 .8 or something. Uh, I'm not sure what size I have at this point, but I'll be able to measure that once I get inside. And uh, this is also the 10 inch drum brakes. There's a 9 and a 10. So this is a, a, a 10. What I have to do now, of course I've got everything up on jack stands, you know, safety. Got it up on jack stand and what I'm going to do is I have to take the differential or the uh, differential cover off on the back and drain all that fluid and then I'll show you how to pull the pin, the bolt, the pin and pull this axle out. Now, in order to make this uh, job a little easier, I'm going to remove the spare tire and uh, this car is rather unique. There's a little key and this part covers up the hole where you put the rods from the jack in. So that keeps people from trying to steal your car. But when you take this and insert it in the hole, turn the key to the left, just the little key comes out. So there's a key from here to here and then you've got the handle. Then you have to put your jack stand together and run it down that little hole right there in case you've ever had to do this. That little, little bitty hole right there. Take your tire down get it out of the way because I have to get all the way up under here. Pardon the movement to get to that differential right there. And I've got to put a pan under there take all those bolts off and drain the fluid. Oh, that's because I've got a trailer hitch too. Oh, I'm sorry. Grunt and groan here. I decided to go ahead and take the receiver out of there. Let me tell you, if you've ever whacked one of those with your knees, it'll make you cuss. And since I'm climbing under here with my head, it's guaranteed I'm going to whack my head at one point or another. So I took the receiver out too. So let me get it set up underneath, find out what size bolts those are, get my uh, capture tray so I don't put differential fluid all over the driveway. Okay, welcome to Tom's One Man Studio. So don't forget to take the plug out of here so when the fluid drains out that it drains into the canister. Oops, I uh, bumped the camera, sorry. Now what you see here is not oil but actually PB Blaster. Um, these things have probably been on here the entire 116,000 miles. I don't know if any service has ever been done to this. So I'm going to take my half inch impact six point socket and my nice little nano and see if I can get up in here and start taking some of these bolts off. I've got it on its lowest setting. Make sure I'm in the yep, right direction. Nope, not enough. Let's go to the next setting. There we go. Now I'm going to leave the top bolt in because when I crack this, I want it to act as a hinge. Good old PB Blaster. You know, there's some silicone on this. I wonder if they, I don't know from the factory if they put silicone or if they put a, an actual gasket. I've seen it both ways. Right. 
Now, let's see if I can crack this. I've got a yeah, putty knife here. I just want to crack the bottom. Now be prepared for a deluge. Actually, there's a See if I can get to the other side here. Watch me struggle. There's a little bit of a lip on it. Loosening up there a little bit. Well, this is tough upside down, let me tell you. There we go. Move it over a little. This way you don't gouge anything. Ah, there we go. Let's see if I can get that all the way out now. This was siliconed. Yeah, it looks like Permatex black, as a matter of fact. All right, so we're going to let this drip a while. And, uh, drip and drain and I'll come back oh wow this is great right here is the bolt that I need to remove in order to pull this pin out then I have to push the axle in toward the planetary gears here and pull a c-clip and that is almost in the perfect position I've heard uh, different stories I don't know how many somebody said it was a 13 millimeter I've seen some videos I gotta figure that out I, you know, 13 millimeter might fit, but I'm so used to working on Hondas and Toyotas and, you know, other Asian vehicles. This is probably uh, SAE, but I'll double check that while this thing is draining. Now, I will also take a peek. Let's see, I've lost my flashlight. Um, I'll have to get my flashlight and come back and take a peek at this and see if I see anything unusual. Yeah, and, you know, there is that distinct odor. Like I say, with what I do for a living, pff, this is nothing. So, uh, too bad we don't have smell vision So, I'll be right back. Okay, let's get back to business. Ah, uh, let's see. Let me get in here. See if I can... Again, there's the bolt I need to remove. And there's the pin. Now, as I understand it, in most cases, there might be a little bit of blue Loctite on these things. And I think there's been service done on this rear end differential before because when you look at this black, looks like Permatex black, they only did it around the outside. Typically, you go to the inside. There's some here, but most of this seems to be on the outside. So someone's obviously been here before. That, I don't think, is factory. So this was a, uh, let's see what size, 5 sixteenths, I believe. Oh, it's hard to see up under here. Yeah, it's a six point. Well, I got to take the glasses off. It's a six point, 5 sixteenths. All right, let's see if we can break this nut, or I'm sorry, bolt. And 
bit of a tight fit there. Oh shoot. Ah, just enough. Oh yeah, that's gonna come out nicely. I think this thing uh, is torqued to around like 15 foot-pounds, if I'm correct, when I was reading some of the data, which, you know, is not much above what a uh, spark plug would be. I've got this long-handled quarter-inch drive here, and that gave me a little more of a fulcrum. All right. Now, the problem is, ah, uh, shoot. Well, idea was was nice. Problem is now I don't have enough room to get it off once I've undone the bolt a little bit. So here's what I'm gonna go. Plan B. Put it back in a little bit. See if I can get it out. Not yet. Man, they made the tolerances close here. Maybe a little bit more. a bit more. Alright, now what I'm going to do if I can see if I can get this off of my finger not quite if I have to I'll get a standard box in type wrench get back in there there we go, loosen it up a little bit more mm, there we go alright go get a 5 16 cents box and I'll be right back again wish I had an assistant naturally in all the tools that I have I don't have a ratcheting 5 16 it goes from like 3 8 to 7 16 so I'm just going to use a standard box end and take this out to the point where I can use my fingers and you got to be careful because this goes all the way through and that keeps the pin in place, which will be the next thing to pull out. Now I could use the socket on here, but my fingers are going to be so slick it's going to be hard to grip the socket. All right, yeah, it looks like there's a little bit of lock tight on there, some tight. So, let's see if we can get this in focus there. So you have this bolt. Now, I'll put this over here with the other bolts. We'll very carefully try and get this pin out, reach on the other side. Now don't go turning anything once you get this out because what will happen is you could, these gears could fall, you'd have to put them back in, that could be a real pistol. So I'm going to slide this out very carefully. Now notice there's a hole at this end and that's where it's going to slip through and mate with the other side but the threads are going to be on this side and then it's going to go through here so it's going to go through all the way through and there's a flat side on each side here where my fingers are it's flat so there is the pin now I'm going to clean all that stuff off what I have to look for is the C-clip there's a metal C-clip in there and I cannot see it at the moment. Let me get my flashlight out. You generally have to push the axle in just a little bit to see that clip. And you might have to use a magnet to pull it out or just kind of work it out until it hits the bottom of the transfer case. Let's get my flashlight out of my pocket. There we go. And let me take a look see. I can see it, but you can't see it because it's flush right now. All right, so let me go 
push a little bit and I will show you how smooth things are. Let me again working on my back here. All right, so I'm going to show you an up top view. See if I can get out of the way of the light. Again, okay, now you can see where the large gear is on the left, and I'm going to go ahead and push the axle a little bit, and you should be able to see it slide over and see the C-clip in a moment. Now bear with me, I'm doing this upside down, so pardon the movement, I very gently pushed the axle toward the center and you can see opposite here I'm touching the C-clip right there that silver thing right there so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a magnet and gently pull that out if not a pair of needle nose and gently pull it out now be careful of those gears too because they are sharp. It may not seem like it, but they're sharp. Let's see if I can zoom in on that. There it is. There you go. Like butter. Fits in the groove. Can't miss the groove. Just slides right in. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to slide the axle out. But before I do that, I'm going to put this pin back in and put the bolt back in just as a temporary stay so that nothing drops out. All right, uh, you got to remember one thing because you had pushed the axle in this way, you couldn't put the pin back in because the axle has to be out here. That's what keeps it from moving too far inward. So once I pull the C clip, I moved it out just a little bit slid the pin back in and then I put the bolts back in just a couple of threads again uh, you don't want to be turning too many things here because these planetary gears drop out oh that makes for a bad day and I don't want to increase the difficulty of what I have to do here lately um, actually too this is the first time I've ever done one of these so uh, kind of trial and error but I did a lot of research and uh, I'm following the, the, the guidelines that I was able to read uh, of course, Haynes and Chilton's eh, kind of give you a basic indication of things to do. But I got on JustAnswer.com and I've been talking with a Ford mechanic by the name of Roy who's kind of guided me in the right direction here. So now, let's go up top and I'm going to pull the axle. The moment of truth is upon us. Be very careful when you pull this out. Don't bang the living daylights out of it. Pull it straight out. Support it. Because there's a bearing and a seal very carefully there we go now let's see if I can get this on the camera there and we'll count the number of splines this has on it too I'll let you know what that is but here is the groove where the C-clip went now I'll be cleaning this up I'm going to look and see if there are any uh, issues as far as scuffing or marks and we're going to get down here and take a look at this seal and the actual bearings. Now I don't have to replace the bearings but if I'm going to this point I might as well. Um, you know, bearings, uh, it was recommended to use BCA which is also national, use a national oil seal. You know for 23 bucks I don't want to have to do this job again so I'm going to go ahead and let's let's examine this uh, seal, and then I'll count the splines. And you know, make sure when you put it up like this and wrap it up so it doesn't drop and damage anything. Let's take a personal up close look. So here's your seal. It doesn't look quite as bad as I thought it would. That's your seal. And I've noticed there are two different types. This one has a chamfer right here. And what I did is I measured the distance from here 
to the inset or the top of that particular seal and it's about three millimeters that way I'll remember pretty much how far it went in and back in the back you'll actually see the race <clears throat> you'll see the bearings and I'm gonna clean this up and I'm gonna pull the seal out very gently I'll probably use a little bit of a pry bar um, I do have a special tool that I'm going to try that I've used on seals, camshaft, and crankshaft. I'll see if it works in this. But again, here's a chamfer. Some had a lip and fit over it this way. And it was pretty much flush. So let me try my special tool and see if that works. But I'm going to clean this all up, you know, stuff it with a uh, paper towel or something here and brake clean it real quick. Well, even the best laid plans of mice and men do not always work. I attempted to pull that seal by using my persuasion tools. Let me back this up. Oops, sorry, wrong direction. I tried to pull the seal using this very gently getting under the lip and it wouldn't budge. I even tried uh, PB Blaster, waited 20 minutes, still really wouldn't budge. Now I've seen this both ways. I've seen some people remove the seal, then put the hammer in, or the axle seal removal tool, and pull it out. I've seen them try and pull both out with the axle seal remover tool, which is basically a slide hammer. So I'll just refer to it as the slide hammer. So I've seen them, like I say, struggle both ways. Well, I couldn't get the seal out, so now what I'm going to do is I went and got the slide hammer, and I'm going to see if I can get both these seals out. PB Blaster's now been in there for at least an hour. Um, it was uh, just wasn't budging. My last option is to use heat. But, well, I like this particular design here. This is the one I got from O'Reilly's. It's a loaner tool. And it kind of captures the inside and the outside. Now you find the one that fits your particular situation, kind of push it in there, it'll catch, much like a molly bolt. And then you tighten this up and that'll be against the actual seal. This will be on the back side of the actual bearing. And then you tighten it up and then you're going to put the rod on here. Now I've already got it installed and I'm going to put the rod on it, but in order to keep it level again, one man show. I'm going to uh, use my jack stand. So let's see how this works. Now, or to keep it level, I'm going to use my jack stand. Right. I'll put it over here. Keep it reasonably level. And then I'm going to slam it. So this will be real time. Let's see how this works. Let me zoom in. See if we can see things move. See, it loosens up a little bit. Well, that didn't work. Let's try Plan B. All right, so I got it out. Uh, I didn't want you to hear me cussing, but it is a separate bearing as well as the seal on the outside. I've seen some that were actually one piece. So this was to the inside there. And this little gizmo, you've got to get it centered just right. 
you got to get it centered just right. Otherwise, it gets a little catawampy. But it took about another 10 pulls. So again, it took about 10 more whacks and some cursing. Well, that's what it looks like. So I'm going to take everything off here. Alright, so this seal does have a lip to it. And here's the bearing. Now, I've seen different situations here. It said keep the writing facing you, but in this case it wasn't facing me. It was actually to the opposite. Well, that's the bearing. Now, let me go clean up the axle, and we'll look inside. Remember when I was talking at the uh, beginning of the video? I should turn this around so you can see it. I was talking about this chamfer here. Well, this is the bearing that has the lip. So sometimes you have to get between the lip and the axle to get this apart. And a whole bunch of rust in here. That might even be some sealant. Let me take a screwdriver and see if that's some sealant too. Yep, that's rubbery. So they put a little sealant there too. Let me get a perspective there. So, uh, you know, I was trying to grab it from the back side, you know, here pull it out or let me get the perspective so to pull it out I'm going to twist it that's facing you that's down so I was trying to pull it this way but to show you I was trying to grab it behind the lip here with the pry bar and pull it this way which transposed that 90 degrees and you can see the seal I tore it up of course in the process so um, I got to measure the splines and we'll clean this up. Oh, let me show you the inside of the axle. I'll also, make sure that you know once you pull all this stuff out, um, there's nothing inside. No paper towels or bearings. I mean, I've seen some people. You know, they've torn up the bearings getting them out, and uh, you don't want to leave that in there. So let me pull the camera. Wipe my hands off. Pull the camera. And we'll look inside. This is probably going to be better with my flashlight. So looking for any scuff marks. Anything out of the ordinary? I don't really see anything. Let's go up top. Okay. Now you see that ridge over there at about the 9 o'clock position? That's not a scuff mark, that's a weld. Your bearing goes in about this far. And then you'll see that ridge where it stops. And then the next ridge is where the actual seal goes. And I've got to clean this stuff up here. So uh, I've cleaned it out. I will eventually break clean this a little bit and make sure there again the nothing's in there. You don't want to leave any bits or pieces. That would be a disaster. And you can see straight down. Hello. So that's what it looks like. Well again, a little cursing. If you hear cursing in the stratosphere, that was me or a nuclear mushroom cloud in my neighborhood, that was me getting mad. But I got it out. So now I've got to figure out which of these seals and bearings, what size. Alright, so there are 28 splines, but I also noticed, if you look right here in the groove where the C-clip goes, there's an O-ring that said, don't damage that. Now, I just have to figure out, I'll go look at my technical details, on which side does the C-clip go? Does the O-ring go against here or against there? And I've got to double check that. I'm thinking, hmm, well, I'm not sure. Let me peruse that and I'll get back to you. But again, 20, 28 splines, but there is that O-ring there. So I cleaned it all up. There's no residue, there's no rust. There was a lot of rust on the outside 
uh, rim where that seal made contact, that lip. Me and the Dremel tool got that little soft, they've got a, a steel and a brass style cleaning wheel. I used a steel one. Like butter. Love this little thing. Works quite well. <clears throat> Jobs like this. I mean, you could use some very fine grit, maybe 220 sandpaper, but uh, let your tools do the work. So again, got that all cleaned up. Well, sports fans, I had to take a little respite for a while. It seems that the bearings and the seal that I purchased were the wrong size. Now, there is a tag that's on one of the bolts on the differential cover that is clearly coded for the 8.8 .8 inch ring. I measured the ring 8.8 inches. When I got the seal, or actually new seals and new uh, bearings, it didn't fit. It was too large. So uh, I looked at several different sites and each one said the same thing, that they should fit. The outside diameter is approximately two and a half inches on each, that bearing and that seal. Well, if you come in here and you measure the old bearing and the old seal, it's more like 2.2, say two and a quarter inches. If you look up the seven and a half inch ring gear, it says 2.2 inches. So my suspicion is somewhere along the line in the assembly of this vehicle on the assembly line, they put the smaller axle on this, put the 8.8 .8 inch ring in it, but they actually put in the smaller axle. Uh, I, I showed you I cleaned all that out. You know, I used the hub puller, pulled everything out. I cleaned it out with brake clean. I then uh, took some red and tacky grease. You could actually use the gear oil if you want and soak and saturate everything. But I just went ahead and used a little red and tacky. I smeared a little bit on the surface. Let's see if I can zoom in there. Turn it a little bit. On the inner surface, before I tried the... Uh, putting the uh, bearing in. So I cleaned it up, made sure there were no scuff marks, got any rust out, used a Dremel tool, made sure there was nothing left in there like paper towel or a bearing piece. A little bit in there. I then took the bearing and I packed it with a lot of grease, you know, preloaded. Let me get this turned around so I can actually see it. There we go. I did a little preloading by putting a lot of the red and tacky grease in there, spinning it. I then put a nice coating around here and on the edges. And I went ahead and started tapping that seal in. Now you got to be careful. You have to tap it evenly so that you don't get catawampy or cockeyed. And I went in and started driving in very gently, a little ball peen hammer, and my old brake pad. I just turned the pad surface there and started popping it in. Well, I got to a certain point the small ball peen hammer didn't do it and I had to use a little persuasion. So I took my five pound engineer's hammer and started tapping that in. Now the disadvantage is I'm on the ground. When this is up on a rack it's just so much easier. So once I got it to that point as to where it was flush here, I then took this old bearing and the brake pad and popped it in until it would actually seat. So remember I had some grease all on the inside here. Here's the seal. The old seal that was on there. But the difference being in this seal is it has a lip. The new seal does not have a lip. This one does. So when you put everything in, this is going to be to the inside. Oh, and also uh, on the bearing, it has some writing on it. I put that to the outside. It told me national. I used national oil seal and national bearing. Keep that to the outside. If you ever have to pull the seal and see what it was to begin with, you'll be able to see that. So I kept it to the outside. But the seal here again has this lip. So I tapped this in as far as I could until it would seat. And you can feel it, feel it and see it. Then, with the seal, I lubed it up the same way I did this. 
and tapped in the seal, making sure you keep it straight. Now it's very rubberized, so you got to be careful. You don't want to tear anything. Now, right here, there's a chamfer, a little bit of an edge, and so that seal goes right there to the chamfer, all the way in. So it's probably in, I don't know, five, six millimeters, easily. So that's pushed all the way in to the chamfer, whereas the old seal would have been flush with the edge. So the new seal, which does not have the edge around it, will actually go in a little bit further and you'll be able to see the chamfer as it bevels this way. Um, let's see. Oh, you know, yeah, part of the problem in the, in the beginning was I said there was a, like a pop and a grab on the brakes. Sometimes it would do it with the actual parking gear engaged, parking brake, and then other times it did it, uh, it actually started getting worse, it would do it after I'd stopped. Well, you know, double check, triple check everything that you do. So in the process of looking at my pads here, you know, there's three little surface areas here that they tell you to put some grease on so things will slide better. So I started checking my springs and my surface areas because I'm going to pull the pad back a little, take a cabinet maker screwdriver, long screwdriver, and put some grease back there. Well, guess what I found? A broken spring, which this particular spring would keep things this way. Now, this spring was actually, let me get it out here, actually behind here. And it was really, really hard to notice until I got up here and there's no end. It apparently has rusted off and broken. Let me get up and see if I can get a look at that. It's absolutely gone. This is the one that's forward. This is the one in the rear. And the new one is a slightly, uh, it has two different shapes on the ends. So make sure you get that uh, correct. So for eight dollars, I went ahead and bought a new hardware kit for this side. I've not taken the wheel off on the other side yet, so I don't know if the same thing happened over there, but we'll find out. And if I have to, another eight bucks, I'll get another kit. Once again, in the middle of my job, the rain came through. Got another little shower, typical for North Carolina at this time of year. <clears throat> so I will get back to the driver's side. But I wanted to show you, I went ahead and jacked the car up and put jack stands under both sides of the axle. And I wanted to show you, this leak was probably worse than the one on the driver's side. So you're now looking at the passenger side. Look at the grease. Holy moly. Now I'm filming this at around 7.30 at night, so that's why I have the spotlights on. Tom's Movie Productions here. But if you look, there's just all kinds of grease in there. Wow. Pretty impressive leak. So that's to show you the right side. Now I'm going to go back to the left side and uh, show you how I attach that spring and go ahead and put the axle in on that side since it's done and then come over here and work on this side. Now, a couple things on this particular axle. Now, again, this is the driver's side. If you notice, close to the splines is a black O-ring. That O-ring is to go closest to the splines or toward the hub. This goes into the differential. So the C-clip, and I've got that somewhere, will actually fit in above that. Let me see if I can get the C-clip. Now that I'm focused, the C-clip will go in here, and the O-ring is going to be here. So when I put that back in, I'll delicately wedge that back in. Let me turn it. And that O-ring will be down here. So I've looped everything up. This is what it would look like 
This is your bearing here, and below that is your seal. And this is the old ones. Now, there's also a bit of a taper here. It's hard to tell, but right here, it begins to increase in size a little bit. You might see the difference in the way the metal appears. This diameter up here is smaller than what's here. So when you start putting this in, you go, wait, that doesn't seem quite right. That seems a little small. Well, that's because it'll tighten up a little bit when it gets to this point. All right, let's slide this axle in. Now remember, slide that black O-ring close to the splines or toward the hub. Oh, you notice my spring, I hooked it back up, it was hanging down here. It connects way up here. The one on the other side looks fine. Let me see if I can zoom in on that and I'll show you again. There you go. Now, again, this was the part that was broken here. And it was hanging down here. So therefore, it wasn't keeping the pads together and that's why it would grab. Now, it's here, goes behind here, and fastens here. Yeah, that's not bad. So let's go ahead and do the, the axle. Be very gentle. Make sure there's no dirt. Throw that in like so. And you'll feel, oh, don't remember, uh, don't forget, you had to take the uh, set screw or set bolt and that big pin out. And we'll push this in. You'll get toward the end, you see how it drops a little, and you'll feel it slide in. There we go. Just like that. Push it all the way in. Now I have to climb underneath the car, put the C-clip back in. Don't think I'll film that because you saw me taking it out. It's the same procedure in reverse. Um, that's just a bear doing this by himself and up on you, uh, you know, turned upside down like a bat. So give me a moment and let me... Uh, fix that. Alright, I've reconsidered that. Let's see if I can get a good focus here. Right in here. Now, you'll see I've pushed the axle all the way in. You'll see just to the left uh, or to the right of the actual flutes you'll, or the splines, you'll see the black O-ring. Now I'm going to set the C-ring to the right of the black O-ring I'm going to use the magnet and kind of partially pop it in. I'll come back and I'll film that. Okay, you can now see where I've put the C-clamp or C-pen, whatever you want to call it, in. And I will push it all the way in with my magnet. And then I will pull the hub to the left, which this is driver's side. I'll pull it out and that will set that. And then I'll work on pulling the right axle out, which means I have to push it in, pull that C-clip out, and then I'll put the big set pin back in there and the set bolt, just so things don't fall out. Now in order to film this, I am truly on my back, and I'm looking up and backwards. So, if you look to the right, you'll see I've pushed the passenger side axle in, and you'll see the C-clip, which is turned around, and you'll see that black O-ring. You'll see on the other side, I have pushed the um, excuse me <coughs> axle to the outside. And the C-clamp you can't see because it's now flush with that spider gear. Now, once I get this C-clip out on this particular axle over here, I will put the big set pin back in here and put the bolt in. Again, just in case you knock something around. And it's like, oh crap, I don't want to have to take this completely off and put this back together. Don't want to go there. Alright, so there's a good view. I hope that's better than the other view. Again, it's a one-man show at night with lighting. Okay, let's uh, pull this axle out. <clears throat>
think that wasn't too bad. Let's see some of the oil, gear oil dripping. Now, let's take a look. You know, I sprayed this down with uh, brake clean before I pulled this axle out to keep as much of the crap out as possible. Now, let's take a quick glance. Uh, that broken spring that I had. That is looking a bit cleaner. But here is the broken spring. It was still intact here, but it was broken here, and it was hanging down here by this hole on the other side. So this one is intact. And you can see how much cleaner the wheel cylinder is. And amazingly, this really didn't get on the pads. And if you look at my pads, I've still got a fair amount of life on them, especially with the rear, the trailing. And so I'll stick a paper towel in this to contain that drip. And then tomorrow, I will come in and um, pull that bearing and this seal. Oh, as a matter of fact, this seal, this one, is not original. Boy, it's pretty worn. You see down in there, it's pretty worn. This one, you can see the chamfer. So this one may not be the same style. I'll, I'll know when I remove it. It's so hard to tell. There's so much gunk on it. It might be, but uh, from outside appearances, it's not. So let me do some more cleanup, and I'm going to call it night, and I'll be back tomorrow. Well, I'm pretty close to being done on this job. I have now cleaned everything up. Both bearings are in, both seals are in, everything's lubed up. I went ahead and put the shaft back in. Now you may notice too, it seems that the driver side shaft is a little bit higher than the passenger side shaft. That's normal. It may look a little cockeyed to you, but that's that's normal. Uh, I went ahead and put in the bolt that locks everything in, and I put a little blue Loctite on there, medium strength, so it's not going to shake loose or vibrate loose or back out. Now I tried to torque it. It says 15 to 30 foot-pounds. Boy, 30 seems like an awful lot, but I could not get my wrench and a small eight millimeter five sixteenths of an inch socket in here I lacked you know gosh maybe an eighth of an inch it was just a little bit too long so I just used a standard box in wrench and tightened it up and if you've ever tightened any spark plugs those are about 12 foot pounds so if you uh, get a feeling for it you know just make it firm so everything's back in I made sure that when I put the shaft in that the black o-ring stays toward the splines or out toward the hub. Both my C-clips are in. I pulled everything out, put the big pin in, and everything is seated. So the next thing I'm going to do is uh, I've already cleaned the surfaces up here. I had to use some thread chasers. As a matter of fact, there was, um, let's see, let me get, I think I focused my, there we go, there we go. Uh, when I took these uh, bolts out you know, they had used RTV on this. There was RTV in each of these holes. I mean, it was at the bottom, even. So I have a good set of thread chasers. And 5 sixteenths of an inch by 18, I believe it was. Uh, even the little bolt here was the same thing. Let's see, that's better. Now you can see it instead of my big fat hand. So I cleaned up those threads. I then took a wire brush, cleaned them up even more. I've taken a wire brush to this. I also used a product called a Super Scraper. Uh, I'll show you that in a minute, and I'll show you my new light that I have here. Super Scraper's great, but you gotta be careful. It's got a carbide end to it, and I, there are several different uh, lengths. I've got the eight inch, but if you've ever had to do any kind of a gasket, oh, this thing is great. And on soft aluminum, you want to draw, because it will gouge. On the steel cover, I could either draw or push, but on this, you want to draw very carefully, and it took that RTV off no problem. Uh, if you try and scrape it with a regular putty knife, it can be a real pistol. This thing is great, guaranteed for life. It's always sharp. If it dulls, you send it back to this guy, American-made. Uh, he'll sharpen it. 
but it is great. It's one of those tools that everybody needs to have. Uh, the when I do the pan, I'm going to use the RTV. They do make a um, gasket for it, but I'm going to use the RTV and put that on there. So I'm not going to add any oil until I put the RTV and put the cover back on and I'm going to let it sit for, well, for my case, overnight. I'll, I'll work on it again tomorrow, but I'm going to let it sit overnight. But I would let it sit at least two hours for it to cure. Oh, now here's my light. Now it might be upside down for you, but it's the Astro 40SL Max. Boy, that's bright. Let's turn that back around here. Again, I'm, I'm upside down here. Let's see if I can turn the intensity down a little bit. There we go. That's better. Now, it's got a magnet on the end, which is great. It'll stick to metal. It has 450 lumens. It's got a hook. And it's made by Astro Pneumatics out there in Mount Airy, North Carolina. Andy Griffith country. A few hours from me. So that's, uh, that's a great little product, too. It'll last a good three and a half, maybe four and a half hours at full intensity, they say. So I've been using it for at least two hours now. And you can adjust the intensity. It's great. It's really good for getting behind intakes and uh, um, intake manifolds and exhaust manifolds. Okay, so for now, let me, uh, I'm going to clean this up one more time. I'm going to blow everything out, all these holes out with compressed air again. And one more um, coating of brake clean to make sure I have a good seal. Phew. I think I've got everything buttoned up now. Now I've put the uh, plate back on and you can't mess that up because you'll see the indentation. If you try and turn it any other way as far as the orientation, it's not going to go on there. You know, your ring gear is sticking out here. Now that's 10 bolts. Um, the Haynes manual says take your RTV and then on that lip on the inside from here to here and around the bolt holes smear a very thin layer of the RTV and right here again this is you know the mating surface I'm just showing you here as perspective right here or closest to the gears put a bead of it as Tommy Lee Jones said in the first Men in Black thought you had a good bead on things didn't you so you put a good sized bead on there I also used a little fluid film on all of my bolts to prevent any corrosion. Uh, if you remember, I did go ahead and use my uh, thread chasers, not taps and dies. These are chasers. I used the chasers, clean that out, uh, brake clean, blew it out twice, clean the surface again with more brake clean. Better too clean than not enough. And I have torque these down. What I did is I put in all 10 bolts, torqued them to just firmness. Then I went ahead and used my torque wrench and started at 12 foot-pounds and did it in a crisscross pattern. That way you don't warp things. And then I went from that to the full 25 foot-pounds. So now I'm going to let this sit for at least two hours, but in my case I'm giving up for the night. My God, it's like 98 percent humidity here. And uh, that's enough for the day. And then tomorrow, I'm going to add the fluid. Now, the fluid is added on the opposite side. Here, there's a plug, and you stick a 3 8 inch um, adapter or an extension into it, and it's up and around. I'll try and show you a picture tomorrow. You stick that in there and you can unscrew it and that's where you add the fluid now this uh, car is supposed to take six pints now just in case there's not a lot of room in there to take that long skinny jug and add stuff so I've got a piece of uh, tubing that if I have to I can add this piece of tubing stick it in the hole and have someone squeeze the actual tube of uh, grease or gear oil into it for me. I think it's thin enough that I could possibly do that. Excuse me, I can't talk today. Think that I could do that. If not, I'll come up with another plan. 
But boy, I tell you, it is a whole lot easier doing this when it's up on a stand. Some kind of a jack. All right, that's it for now. Getting close to the finish line here. Uh, I'm going to show you exactly where the small port is to add the gear oil. And uh, I want to make sure that you saw these tools first. I didn't want to forget that. Now, I talked about the super scraper as far as being able to uh, scrape off those gaskets. So there are different sizes, but that's the size I like. And you can get it online. I think Amazon has it, probably eBay. This is the 8 inch. And the original super scraper, double edged carbide scraper. And I believe I'd gotten this on Amazon. I don't know, 30 something dollars maybe. Comes in a tube. Because again, that has a carbide edge to it. And I tell you, it is sharp. Now, in order to get this uh, gear oil in, and I'm using some Valvoline 80 weight 90, I've seen this at Walmart before and decided to get one. It's a little mini pump, it's called a multi use pump. I'll put this top line into my gear oil and this will go into the differential case and I'll pump enough I think it said six pints I'll pump it up until it starts to run out a little bit and you stick your finger in there and check the level if it doesn't start running out at the bottom and then put the plug back in let me move this stuff out of the way and I'll show you where exactly you have to add the six pints Again, it's a lot easier if it's on a rack, but not on a rack. Alright, uh, sorry, my memory card holder flap was open. So, uh, once again, here is where the plug is. Now, I'll zoom in. This is on the driver's side. And we'll zoom in. You can see the stain. And I have the plug most of the way out. So I'll put my little tube in there and pump all this gear oil in there. You can see not a lot of space back in here. I have to get up under the middle of the actual vehicle and get between the fuel tank and that differential assembly. Don't want to do that. For eight bucks, I'll use the multi-purpose pump. Well, poot. Uh, had a little malfunction with my little pump. It didn't work quite as well as I thought it would. I think maybe I've gotten a bad one. I kept suctioning the fluid out of the actual plastic container, but I kept getting a lot of air when I was trying to push it through into the differential case. So, as you can see, you are able to get it up in there. I snip the end off, and I just reach up under there where you can't see, and uh, squeeze it, and it takes a while, and squeeze it and get it in there. But I did run a little short, I think, because I've lost so much in this pump trying to get it to work. Uh, I lost a bit, and so I'm going to have to get uh, another couple of pints of the valve in here. It was, it's supposed to take six, but I put my finger in there. I still don't feel the level. And then, like I said, I probably lost a number of ounces trying to uh, get this pump to work. So... So off to the auto parts store again tomorrow. I'll get me another couple of pints. Okay, so I'm back. Again, I had to take another little bit of a break because I had to get my daughter off to college. I have reassembled my truck here and so took it for a test drive. Things seem to be okay. So as a small recap, what initially I thought was just a brake problem ended up being a brake problem and a rear axle problem. Once I removed this driver's side rear tire, I found grease everywhere. And the passenger side was actually worse. So I had two axle seals that leaked badly. I went ahead and replaced both the bearings and the axle seals. And as we discovered in the process too, this uh, clearly states on the small metal tag that's attached to the bolt, or one of the bolts on the differential cover, it's an 8.8 .8 inch ring. When I measured it, it's 8.8 .8 inches. But the diameter of the bearings and the seals should have been 2.5 inch inside diameter. It ended up, they were 2.2 or 2 and a quarter, 
which is more for the 7.5 inch ring. So somewhere at the factory, this, this got mixed up. That's the only thing I can figure. So I <clears throat> did that, you know, I've got the gear oil in, took it for test drive, things seem to be okay. So, uh, and like I say, initially the problem was the, the brake. I kept hearing that pop. So in the beginning, I would release the emergency brake and start to back up. You'd hear that pop, and then you would apply the emergency brake and, you know, put it in gear, take the emergency brake off, and you move forward. It would pop. And I wasn't sure if it was left or right since I didn't have anybody to drive the truck for me. I just knew it was the rear brakes. Ended up being on this driver's side, one of the springs had actually rusted through and broken. And it took me two or three inspections before I found it. You really couldn't see it because it was underneath the actual wheel hub. And once I pulled that axle out, then I could see it. So it always pays to double check, double, can't talk today, double check and triple check your work. So I replaced that spring, I cleaned it all up because there's a lot of rust, a lot of grease, and uh, the pads still had a lot of life on them. So I just lubricated of those three areas where the um, metal for the pads, or I should say shoes more correctly, meets the actual back side of the uh, splash shield. So I lubricated that, cleaned it up, things look fine, replaced that one spring. It's like an $8 kit per side. So I replaced that one spring and uh, adjusted the brakes. So things seem to be working quite well now. Now what I did discover too is because this truck has leaf springs in the rear, the problem was you have to lift this rear end up so high. And what I did is I lifted up uh, the rear end so that I could get to both tires at the same time and I could spin them and make my adjustments. Uh, I wish I'd had a concrete pad to work on, but I didn't in this case. So it required my jack and um, several pieces of wood. Now the difficulty there was, as I've mentioned before, safety, 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 because I was jacking this up on a jack and used three pieces of wood, it actually popped off and it dropped. Now, I'm always, again, one for safety. When I put those jacks underneath, I was pushing them with a broom handle just in case that happened, and it did. So, uh, I think I'll end this for now. Hopefully this helps. Not a difficult job. It was just the mix-up in the axle size and the inner diameter of those bearings and the seals. We'll see you on the next video.